All right, good morning. Turn your Bibles to Acts 4. That's where we are. We're ready for verse 32. Acts chapter 4 and verse 32. Any announcements that we need to make other than what? Good. Yeah. Sure. All right, we can do that. <clears throat> Glad that he's at least getting well enough he can get out of rehab. Anything else? It was a good day, and we appreciate that. It was a good day. Had a lot of a lot of folks, and we appreciate that. Always good to. Days like that, sometimes you, you wonder about them. Um, they are refreshing, though. There's a lot of work that's put into them, but they are refreshing. And Maybe maybe somebody saw us in a good light. They'll think about coming and seeing us more often, and we'd appreciate that. All right, Acts chapter 4. We're ready for verse 32. In Acts 3, we saw healing, if you will, of man. And in Acts chapter 4, beginning, it talks about those that had brought Peter and John in. And they were using, I guess what I want to say is they were using a heavy hand to try to really stop Peter and to stop John and, and really not just so much stop them as to stop Christianity. I mean, this was the this was the religious sect that was was working in behind the scenes, yes, but overtly to to stop Christianity and stop it in its tracks. And in verse 23, especially where we just ended last week, we talked about a prayer for boldness and really how the church of then and the church of today needs to stand boldly and, and proclaim the great message of God and proclaim it, <clears throat> excuse me, in a bold manner, knowing that uh, as Christians, we will never be on the majority. And you might say, well, wait a minute, Christianity is, I, I get you there. But from a standpoint of standing for the truth and standing for the whole truth, we're always going to be in the minority. And from a world standpoint, when you look at a world standpoint, Christianity is that minority. And then when you get to standing for the truth, it, it's even a smaller minority than that. And, and we know that. And so we do need, as the early church needed boldness, we need boldness as well. And beginning in verse 32, it says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the, the things he possessed was his own, but they all had, or they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. No, nor was there anyone among who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of all the things that were sold, laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each one as they had need. The early church, and one of the great earmarks, if you will, of the early church was that it was benevolent, that it helped those that were in need. Now, through the years, and we see this again and again, and we talked a little bit about it when we hit Acts chapter 2. One of the, the things that especially in the, the 20s and 30s, the 1920s and 1930s, that is, uh, of uh, in, with regards to the church was this idea, well, this was promoting, and, and this was one of the criticisms, this was promoting communism. This was promoting the idea of everybody is equal, everybody is the same, everybody that has wealth should give to those that, that have none, but that it all should be equal. That's not what this is teaching. That's not what I don't believe they did in the early church. 
They were of their own accord. They were of their own free will. They chose to bring this, these gifts. They chose to, to, to sell their land. They chose to bring the money in. It was distributed. It was distributed to those. And it's interesting. Notice what it says. <clears throat> Nor was there anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of land, sold them and brought them and proceed, uh, brought the proceeds, excuse me, of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each one as anyone had need. It was not as everyone to make it equal across the board. There are those that have been uh, more blessed, if you will, in business, more blessed in maybe families, and they're able to, from a standpoint of percentages, they're able to give more to help individuals. But the early church was not about, you know, everybody's the same. It was about, though, that those that had a need, that need was taken care of. And it's always interesting to me that when the church finds a need, sees a need, hears of a need, that it's always responding. And it's always good that it responds. And the early church did, too. Notice, though, in verse 32, at the beginning of this paragraph, the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. There was great unity in the early church. Now, that's not to say, because we're fixing to, to fixing. <laughs> that is a southern colloquialism that I use every once in a while, so just overlook it. Fixing. They are about to, to see, or we are about to see, the early church having problems. We get especially in Acts 6, there's a, there's a little, if you will, internal strife. And it's not so much, if you will, in the church that you have struggles. It's how you go about those struggles and how you handle those struggles that really is important. Because we do have differences of opinion. I think the Bible, even if you go to the book of Romans and you see, especially in the 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 13th, 14th, well, 14th chapter, really, the 14th chapter of the book of Romans, you see also in the church of Corinth and 1 Corinthians, differences with regards to especially matters of opinion. Now, doctrine, of course, and we talked about this in Acts 2, so I'm not going to just spend a great deal of time on it unless you want to. But <clears throat> doctrine, we cannot, we cannot compromise doctrine. We cannot change doctrine. We cannot change what God says. And when God tells us a way, we can't change that way. We can't change the means. We can't change those things. But with a matter with with regards to matters of opinion, we can. With regards to matters of opinion, we can have a difference of opinion. And it's important that we have this mindset of verse 32. Let's have unity. Let's be of one mind. Let's be individuals that can disagree without being disagreeable. Let's see eye to eye, and sometimes let's say that there needs to be compromise on this side, and the next time maybe compromise on this side, that we, we need to look at it from that standpoint. I don't just need to have my way, and then if I don't get my way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a fuss. I've seen that. I've seen it firsthand. It's the wrong attitude. It's the wrong way to be. It was not the way the early church was. And then let me finish uh, just two verses, and <clears throat> this helps us out, and there may be some that want to talk. <clears throat> Joseph, who was also named Barnabas, and that's really the name by which we know him best. Uh, he was called Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement. And, and everywhere you see Barnabas, you see him encouraging whether it was churches or people or in, from a standpoint of groups or individuals, he did that. He encouraged folks. A Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. And so he, too, was an encourager. At this time, he was an encourager of those that had a need. What can I do to help them? And so he did. Now, anything anybody would like to say before we venture on?
Yes. That's right. <laughs> oh, I'm waiting on him to come back. It's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Good point. Yeah. They, uh, they, they didn't. You know, that's the way they felt. And, and who knows? Who knows? What was it? We were. I was. Uh, this was not last year, but I guess year before last, Suzanne and I had gone uh, for vacation to the Smoky Mountains, and we've been there, I don't know how many times, but we went, and and we uh, drove around Cades Cove, and you know, virtually at the back end of Cades Cove, you know, there's a rest area, if you've been there, there's a rest area, and there's a grist mill, you know, several little things to see, and and I was intrigued because there had been a bear there before that, and I had been able to talk to one of the rangers about the bear, and uh, there were also some deer that were there and uh, at the time, and of course, you were able to get pretty close to them, and I was able to stand there and just look at them, and they were in full velvet, and so it was very it was beautiful. And my wife was in line to buy something at the gift shop. Uh, or to go in, which translation for her going in means to buy something. And and so she was standing in line because at that time, remember, we were still going through all the, you know, you can only have three people in the 35 square feet area and all that stuff. And so I said, uh, well, what are you going to do? Well, and we had been, we had been looking for a bear for a stuffed bear for Graceland. And uh, she said, well, I'm going to buy so-and-so, I'm going to buy so-and-so. And I said, don't spend any money. And this lady behind her looked at me kind of funny, and Suzanne said, well, you can't take it with you. And I said, no, but I want to have some while I'm here. And the lady said, never thought about it like that. And she liked that. Well, but as Jim said, they, they really, they were still hanging around Jerusalem. They hadn't been dispersed yet. The great diaspora had not occurred. We'll see that in Acts chapter 8. And and so consequently, they they really thought, Lord's coming back quickly. And that was always, and that's something to keep in mind. Go back and read, or in your studies maybe this week, read First Thessalonians. Read it with the understanding that they thought the Lord was coming back then, right then. And so, uh, and then there was some other misgivings in First uh, Thessalonians, but that, that helps you. That was a mindset in the early church. The Lord's coming back, so we don't need it. Anything else? Good point. Okay, well, let's go into the, the fifth chapter. We still have this benevolent, <clears throat> excuse me, reputation that existed in the early church. And, and isn't it interesting? Think about, I want you to think about something for a minute. I want you to think about what all was going on in the early church. Now, we're not that far in from Pentecost, if you will. And we're not that far in from the death of Christ. We're not that far when we talk about, say, Acts 5. Isn't it interesting that Luke spends so much time, if you will, in the first few chapters of the book of Acts, not honing in on what was being preached or where it was being preached or what Peter said or what Paul said. Well, of course, Paul wasn't really wasn't on the scene yet, but Peter and James and John... He was focusing in on the early church, but he, while he focused in on the stories, the history, he focuses in a lot on the benevolence of the church. It's just an interesting idea uh, to me when you think about kind of what's he, what's he pinpointing. And he's not really pinpointing evangelism. He's pinpointing benevolence. But there was a certain man, beginning in, in chapter 5, verse 1, named Ananias, with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds. His wife also, being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself while it remained was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your own in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You've not lied to men, but to God. For whatever reason, Ananias and Sapphira, as you look back at this, notice what it says. 
verse two, he kept back part of the proceeds. His wife also knew about it. They laid it at the apostles' feet, but they laid it there with the idea of saying, this is every penny we got for what we sold the land for. And that's the condemnation, and that's really what Peter is saying. It was in your control. You could do and say what you wanted to, but why have you lied? Go, go on. Let's read the story. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down, breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose, wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Now, it was about three hours later. His wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter answered, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet, breathed her last, and the young man came in, found her dead, carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. They kept back part. They kept back part. Is that reasonable? Why not? Because Peter says it was yours. It was in your control. It was yours to do with what you wanted to do. And so it was reasonable that they could have kept back part. Maybe, maybe they were saying, this is every penny we got for the sale of the land. And they were wanting people to praise their generosity. Maybe, maybe, it was the fact that they had planned this out because they knew that sale of the land would get out. And so they wanted to not only hear the praise of men, but they wanted to show their generosity. You know, oh, man, they didn't just give. They gave all of it. Who knows why? It doesn't really tell us their motive other than this is what they did. They sold it. They held back part of it. Peter does not condemn them for holding back part of it. Peter doesn't say you, should, you shouldn't have held back part of it. He just said it was in your control and you've lied. You've done exactly what you shouldn't have done. Now, interesting because Peter, as he talks to uh, Sapphira, or as she comes in, notice that he says, how is it that you agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? How is it that you thought the Lord wouldn't know this? How is it that you thought the Lord would not recognize this? There's a great side story, if you will, and a great side understanding that I think should be seen in this. And that is the idea that, the early church was trying to show God knows everything. You think you've hidden it. And there's a lot of things in our life that we can hide from people. There's some things we can't because it just comes through, but there are a lot of things that you can hide from people and they'll never know. I may look at you and tell that you don't feel well. But if you don't tell me what's going on, I really won't know. It's sort of like uh, had a man years ago, a few years ago, <laughs> and he was having uh, physical troubles. He was still, in his, he was in his 50s. Yeah, he was in his 50s. He was a good man. He's a deacon in the church. Um, really good. Years before, when he was college age, he had actually gone to school uh, to Harding. Yeah, he had gone to Harding, had made a preacher. Uh, he had gone to Harding for the purpose of making a preacher. He had made a preacher. He had preached for a few years, but he, he realized that that's not where his talents laid. He ended up being uh, working in the medical field, providing well for his family, not overly well, but well. And... Uh, uh, just a good guy, a good guy. I counted on him really for support. 
more than anything. Could teach a really good Bible class and uh, very knowledgeable of the scriptures. And he he and his wife had two sons. And these sons, they must have dropped them on their head when they were little. <laughs> I mean, you know, they couldn't walk straight line if if their life depended on it. They were just, they, and it's not that they were bad. I mean, they didn't get it. Well, they didn't, get, they weren't put in jail. <laughs> they, they weren't just terrible. One of their morals have since, uh, since they grew up and, and got out on their own, have really lacked, sadly. But he was going through this stress of of that, and I didn't know exactly what was going on with that. And his mother was not, I knew his mother well. His mother was not in good health. And just that stress and the fact that he couldn't let go of it. And so I was sent to the hospital. He was in the, he had, they, he had gone to the emergency room and, and they had put him in a room and uh, his wife called me up and said, because we had eaten out a few times and and been very, very friendly. And, and uh, she said, see if you can get him to talk. And so I went up and he was watching Gunsmoke, I think. He was either that or Bonanza, I forgot now which. But anyway, uh, sitting, I just sat beside his hospital bed and we just talked about the TV and came to... I think in between shows, and I said, you know, now would be a real good time to talk. Would you like to talk? Nope. There's some things I know going on. Would you like to talk about? No. Well, you have to respect that. You can't force people to talk. You have to respect that. He wouldn't talk about it. A week later, he was dead. Died of a, uh, of a heart attack. And... You know, you wonder if if he'd have just talked, if he'd have found somebody, if not me, somebody else that he felt comfortable talking to. But he was one that always held it in and didn't feel comfortable talking. Well, I didn't know what was going on in his life. I knew generalities, but I didn't really know what was going on in his life. I know God knew. And the early church needed to be impressed with that idea. And I'm convinced that one of the reasons that God preserved Acts 6 was so that the church would understand God knows what's going on. And this is a, you know, you say, well, preacher, go back to the Old Testament. Go back to Psalms. Go back to to all the psalmist said about the omniscience of God and, and really through the Old Testament. Yeah, but here's a perfect example of it. You lied. You lied you tried to pull one over on God, but you know you can't do that. And so ultimately, they both passed away. They both were buried. You might ask the question, well, didn't she know what had happened? To, didn't Fyra know what had happened to Ananias when she came? Well, evidently not. That's one of the, the great questions that that is always asked about her. She evidently didn't. She kept up, or you might say, well, maybe she knew and she just kept up the, the appearance. I don't know. Maybe she did. But the result, look at verse 11. Great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Great fear. They were, this fear is a fear of respect. It's not a fear from the standpoint of afraid of there, there are different. There's different fears, different levels, I guess you could say, of fears. Just different fears. There's phobias. Phobias are what you're afraid of. We all have, we all have fears. The two fears we're all born with are the fear of no, of noise and the fear of falling. That's the two fears we have. Then we get over some of those, but we develop more. You know, I don't know what your phobia is. I can, I can tell you one or two of mine, but we all have phobias. That's not the fear that's mentioned here. The fear that's mentioned here is more of an idea of respect, awe, and I, a sense of awe. And so the church is moving forward with great numbers. As we know, Acts 2, the Lord added to the church daily, such you should be saved. And part of it is, is they saw the power of God. And that's important that we see today, and we show people today the power of God. 
anything about it, like you say. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you didn't let them linger because you, you let them lay there too long. They're going to begin to stink. The flies are going to get on them. And, and so, no, that, they, they didn't have what we have today. You know, today we drag it out. Now, it used to be worse than what it is today. You know what's changed? You know what's changed? Why funerals have changed the way they've changed? Money. Money. Used to, though, how, many, how long was visitation? About three days, right? You'd have it one night, all the next day, and then part of the next, and you'd have a funeral. But funeral directors, that's costly for them. And so now you have it like maybe a night and up in the next day uh, until uh, till burial or till the service. And uh, so, yeah, but no, in the first century, they they pretty well, when you were declared dead, you were dead. And they, they wrapped you up and put you out. Because like I say, you had flies. You had uh, you have you have when you stop breathing, you you begin to de to decompose immediately, and, and it's interesting. So yeah, no, it, I, it does seem quick in our society, but not for them, not for them. So I would agree with you. Yeah, it's quick. Yeah, but not for them. Uh huh. Uh huh. That's a good point. Yes. I, I I think that that's a great discussion that I'm not. I, I know what I feel, but to say this is what it is. Yes, the, it, it's the word ecclesia. It's the word that we think of church. It is the first time that it's found uh, in the Bible or in the book of Acts. And it is. That is true. And I think that the key here is the church upon all who heard these things. I know the word and is there, Kai, and it says upon all the church and upon all, but I think it was probably the churches that heard. And faith grows by experience, right? I mean, that's, that's the only way faith really grows is by experience. Now, now that experience could be reading the Bible, it could be seeing things, but that's how faith grows. And, and that's my take on it. I'm not saying that's the definitive answer, but that's my take on it. Well, you haven't had the diaspora, yes, but not everybody stayed in Jerusalem after the Passover. They all began to go home. No, 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 no. Then added. Yeah. 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 There's a there's a a, a statement. Oh, I'm not going to attribute it to whoever because I may be wrong. But the thought was that there were 55,000, population was 55,000 in Jerusalem at this time. And so it could just be what you're saying. Yeah, there were, yeah, yeah, thought to be. Yeah. And once again, I, I can't remember who. I, I don't know if Josephus said that or not. I'm not going to say who, but yeah. Yeah, that's the thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 When, when we sin, it's a good point, excellent point. When we sin, we, we always sin against God, right? We can at times sin against both man and God, but we'll always, when we sin, sin against God. Excellent point. Anything else?
and thought about it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, great grace. Yeah. Yeah. I hadn't thought about it, but no. Hmm. Good point. Didn't catch it. Sure. Absolutely. Anything else? And so through the hands, verse 12, of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick into the streets, laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall upon them on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities of Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Now see, that's where I get the idea that they were spread out. See, the surrounding cities were hearing this and bringing these people in. Now, that's where I get that. I'm not saying I'm right, but that's where I got what I was uh, trying to say a while ago. Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, they were filled with indignation, laid their hands on the apostles, put them in common prison. But at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors, brought them out, and said, Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they had heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught, but the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. So it, it's, the, it's the early persecution of the church. And notice that, that it, it continues. Notice that, first of all, it's kind of interesting, um, this runoff I have here, identifies this paragraph, verses 12 through 16, as continuing power in the church. Well, that's what you see. Remember, that's what they had to have. The We've never studied, I've never studied with you the history of the Bible. The history of the Bible is, is interesting, but you've got to understand that there was, I guess, for lack of a better term, continuing inspiration. In other words, these things were happening, and they would have had, they would be the people of that day, would have had scrolls, copies of scrolls of, say, Old Testament. But they wouldn't have anything of, say, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, you know, Matthew through Revelation, wouldn't have any of that. Matter of fact, um, from a standpoint of chronology, 1 Thessalonians may have been the first book of the New Testament time-wise that was written. And that if you really look, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are some of the last of the books of New Testament time that were written from a standpoint of time when they were written. You didn't have those things. You didn't have these things. So how could we convince men? How could we show men that um, the truth needed to be listened to and what the truth was? And so it says that they continued with great power, great miracles. And that ended up, verse 17, with them getting thrown into prison. That ended up with, with folks that were upset. Because go back to, um, where was it? Well, it was in chapter 4, that's where it was. In chapter 4, at the end of chapter 4, it talked about how the, one of the big things they were preaching was what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was the definitive answer for the early church. That Jesus came out of the grave. And so, what else did they have? Well, they had the ability to heal. And as they did, this indignation arose. Well, notice what it says, verse 17. The high priest rose up and all those who were with him. The Sanhedrin council. And it says, which were of the sect of the Sadducees. The Sadducees, the folks that didn't believe in the resurrection of any kind. 
and they were filled with with indignation. Now this this is a this is not a nice word. <laughs> this indignation. They were they were upset to say the least. But it it is a sense of uh, the word has a sense of jealousy more than than hatred. They're they're jealous of what's going on. And so as the church, of course, is growing and it's getting more and more attention, the Sadducees are not liking what they hear because what is happening is people are saying, well, we don't need to be part of the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees were not the largest sect of that time. Pharisees were. But the Sadducees didn't want to hear people, you know, not listening to what they had to say. And so they had the apostles, what? Well, they had them thrown into prison, but... Notice that an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors, and there was the commission. If you stop and think about it, this is this is just like the Great Commission, a little different in what it says, but nevertheless the same idea. Go. There's the first. There's the first point of this commission. Go. Don't stay. Don't stop. Go. Now. He doesn't say necessarily at this point. Now, yeah, he's fixing to say in just a second. But right now, he's just saying, you got to go. The idea first is to go. Stand. Now, that stand can take several different connotations. You might say, well, from this standpoint, in this verse, what he is saying is literally stand physically. And that would be correct. But also, you could imply that since they're going to go and stand, that they're going to have to stand from a spiritual standpoint. Because not everybody's going to hear what they have to say. Go stand where? In the temple. This is where everybody was going. And think about it. This is where, number one, everybody was going. Number two, they were going there for the purpose of worship, right? They were going for the purpose of being closer to God. And so he says, go stand in the temple and speak to the people. All the words of life. Makes a great sermon. I've preached this little verse before. Go, stand, speak. Speak to what? Speak to the people and speak to them all the words of life. Not just some, but all. Now, how much do they need to know? I was reading something yesterday for my own amusement and, and, and edification, and it was an article in which the individual, the writer, made the statement. He said that when people come to Christ, they must know about Christ. Well, how much and what? And I think I would differ with him on some of that, but that was his point. Here are some things to know about Christ, and I and, and that part was well done. And the, those are there are things we need to know about Christ as we come to him. That needs to be taught. That needs to be shared. That needs to be spoken to others. And that's what they were told to do. And now let's finish the paragraph. When they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and talked. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. So they're creating an uproar. I want you to think for a minute about how they were going about creating an uproar. In our day and age, we have protests. In our day and age, we're having more and more and more protests. And and folks protest Everything from the way the police handle the situation to the way a neighbor handles the situation to the way our elected officials are handling the situation to the way the Supreme Court handles the situation, so forth. So it, you've seen all this on, on the news, so I don't need to, to rehash all of that. And some of those protests have become violent. Some of those protests have become uh, Anarchy, or, or trying at least to to start anarchy. It's interesting that the early church was not trying to stir trouble. They simply put, were trying to to teach 
people what they needed to do in order to be saved so that heaven would be theirs. That's really what the church is about, right? Church is about spreading the gospel. That's what we're about. Spreading the gospel so that people will obey it and people will go to heaven. Now, there are some, and we will put the word churches in quotation marks, that are becoming political pits. But that's all they talk about is politics. And that's and, and they basically, you know, uh, I don't know how they're getting away with it, but th- they're telling people this is how you need to vote and this is how you need to think. And and then they're still considered a nonprofit organization. And by nonprofit, you can't do that. By law, nonprofit organizations, I can talk to you about the morals that the Bible teaches, and I can talk to you about uh, even political things, but by law, not by God's law now, but by man's law, I have to present both sides. And if I'm going to, if we are going to remain a nonprofit organization, in other words, if I came in here, uh, say, pres- next presidential election, and I'm not going to do this, but if I came in here and said, these are the issues, and this is who you vote for, if the government wanted to, they could shut us down. Now, if I come in here and say these are the issues and this is what this side says on it and this is what this side says on it, you make your decision, that I can do legally. The elders can do legally. God's law, though, is not about what this political side believes or that political side believes, but here's the here are the issues. But the early church was going about stirring up the people, not because of issues, but stirring up the people to say, here, listen to the gospel. It's the good news. It's the best news. This is what's going to save you eternally. And you need to listen. And so there were there were these times in which we see these upheavals. Um, there have been writings, Francis Chan and others have written about uh, being radical, but being what I would call religious. And their idea of radicalism is not going off to the left or to the right. Their idea of radicalism is simply put, standing for what's true. Now, Chan is not a member of the church. Chan's got a lot of religious beliefs that I don't follow, don't agree with. But the idea of being radical for the Lord in standing up for the Lord in a time in which most people won't, I agree with. And that's what the early church did. They were also working sort of as a minority, trying to push forth, but trying to share the gospel with others. And so there were those that were upset. And notice what it says, the high priest and those who who those with him, those who came with him, called the council together with all the elders of the church, children of Israel, and sent to prison to have them brought. They're going to convict them. But what's their crime? And how did they do it? They just simply went to the temple and they just spoke the truth. Our responsibility is to be responsible to people not for people. Our responsibility is to teach and preach. Their responsibility is to pick and choose. Just like then your responsibility becomes to pick and choose. So as uh, I said last week, I'm responsible to you. I'm not responsible for you. I'm responsible to you to teach the gospel, but I'm not responsible for you in that you will give an account of your life and the choices you made. And that's the difference. And so, but then I'll be held accountable for, did I fulfill my responsibility to you? And that would be part of my responsibility. And and the same with you towards me. Anything else? Okay, so the officers came to the prison. They did not find (laughs) <laughs> they didn't find them. Why? Because they were in the temple. And they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely, guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. 
Now, when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple teaching the people. Okay. So now words getting to the higher officials. We we have decided, we have made a decision. We are going to, to deal with these fellas. They go to get them. They're not there. Where are they? They're in the temple preaching. When the captain went and the officers brought them without violence, for they feared the people lest they should be stoned. So here's the problem. They're told, high priest says, go get them. They're in, well, they're in the temple. Go get them. Well, the people, they're in the temple. Go get them. And so they were afraid of the people. And when they brought them, they set them before the council. The high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you filled Jerusalem. Now, look, there's a key word, at least for me. Filled Jerusalem. Not just them. But you see, you tell one. One tells two. Two tells four, right? Four tells eight. Eight so forth and so on, keeps multiplying. And so you fill Jerusalem with your doctrine and intended to bring this man's blood on us. In other words, they saw Peter and John's teaching as being say, as saying it was their fault. They crucified Christ. And so Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Of course, the command was what? Go stand in the temple and speak. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered, by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be a prince and a savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. So also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Think about what he says. Here's, is this all of the sermon? Don't know. Is this all of the, the defense? Don't know. Is this everything that's given? Don't know. But what is said is so powerful. First of all, we got to obey God. We got to listen. We got to do what God says rather than what men say. Second of all, we need to know Jesus came forth out of the grave. Jesus was res- resurrected. Thirdly, no, you did murder him. You did murder him. You hung him on a tree. Fourthly, though, God exalted him. God set him at the right hand to be prince and savior. Fifthly, God called Israel to repentance. In order that, sixthly, forgiveness of sins might be offered. And verse 32, finally, we're witnesses of these things. So also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those that obey him. We're witnesses of these things. We know these things to be true. We have to tell these things. And so it's a great little point for us. And it sounds much like what? What Peter had said in Acts 2, right? Pretty much the same outline, really. And uh, but it's powerful. These are the things you need to know, and these are the things you need to be concerned with. Anything else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that they want they want to to feel innocent, and in. You know, you feel for him. I'm sorry. I feel for him from this standpoint. I killed an innocent man. And I'm thankful for him. Sounds odd. But if they hadn't, where would we be? But thirdly, I let God judge them. But I, and so I don't revel, I don't just say, oh, you know, I'm so thankful for them for what they did, but I'm thankful for the fact that in what they did, and this is how God used people throughout the Old Testament. God used people throughout the Old Testament oftentimes to say, correct Israel, bring them back. Did God make them do it? No, they made their own choices. They made their own bed. They had to lie in the choices they made. These, these Romans made these decisions. But in doing so, the salvation of mankind was ultimately placed into effect by what they did. Anything else? It's not the best place to end, but it is the place where we will end. 
So we will get into the sixth chapter. We're getting into the meat of the book of Acts. And uh, but the the power of God, the the blessings that we have because of the power of God and sa- the salvation that comes to us as children of God is truly a great blessing. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day and for this opportunity that we've had to study your word for the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. And while we know the early church had many obstacles that they had to overcome both internally and externally, we realize that we're really very much so in the same crossroads. And we ask that you give us the strength, the courage, the boldness, to proclaim your word to those that will hear and realize that while many will not, that does not preclude us from from doing anything. We should always be individuals that go stand and speak in simple and speak in homes and wherever we can be heard. We ask that you watch over us, that you bless us and keep us. Hold us as we hold to you, for this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Y'all have a great week. Thank y'all.